silence descends. It's really good to hear uh, the chatter and, and the, the conversations going on there. And it gives that lovely sense of, of the family feeling of the place. Uh, and it's good to hear that. Uh, you're very welcome uh, this morning. Good morning to you all. Morning. It is good uh, to see you all out for, for worship here uh, this morning. Um, if you're visiting with us, uh, I know we have a few visitors here this morning, it's good to have you with us. And we do trust you will know something of that sense of uh, our family and fellowship here uh, as we worship God uh, together. It's good to have family and friends of Harry and Matthew here. Uh, we're going to be celebrating the sacrament of baptism. Um, it's good uh, to be able to do that uh, as always. It's a wonderful sacrament uh, to celebrate together. So you're welcome uh, with us here uh, today uh, as well. Just a few announcements uh, I want to make uh, before we begin uh, our service. Uh, first of all, can, can I thank all those who came down on Monday evening to help uh, with the graveyard cleanup. Um, thankfully, it wasn't uh, as bad as it was last year because of lockdown, but there was still a lot of work had to be done. Um, so thank you for coming down and doing that. I even managed a few minutes work myself. I normally come down and just talk, but I, I managed to get a wee bit of work done as well. But it, it's, it's looking well, it's basically down the far end, which is harder to keep, of course. Uh, so thank you uh, for that. Just to remind uh, members of committee and members of session that we are meeting uh, this Tuesday evening, 7.30, in the hall. All the medications will be in place. So committee meeting commencing at 7.30 and then session uh, for uh, a quick meeting after that, just to go through some more uh, guidelines and restrictions and so on. For you, uh, members of the congregation, uh, we did for your diary as such as well. Um, Sunday the 11th of July, uh, we're going to have a short congregational, com near said congregational committee meeting, a congregational meeting after morning worship. Uh, you'll have received the, the financial reports for the year about four Sundays ago there. Uh, I trust you've had time to peruse through them uh, and have a look at them. I know they're very complicated this year because of um, the Charity Commission and all the rest of it, but it's all there. Thank you to David again for his work on them. Um, but they have to be approved by members of the congregation before they go on the Charity Commission website. So for a couple of minutes after uh, morning worship on the 11th, uh, we will do that. It has to be announced for two Sundays. We don't break the law. Um, so we'll be announcing this Sunday and next Sunday and then the following Sunday we'll meet for a few moments afterwards. Ladies of the congregation, I trust on the way in uh, you received a little flyer about the walk and the afternoon tea. If you didn't, um, speak to Valerie afterwards. I know there's some more in the vestibule there. I spoke about this last week. Um, the PW have arranged, uh, it says a walk stroke stroll in Drumahoe Park, uh, followed by afternoon tea in the Manse Garden. And that's on Saturday the 24th of July. The walk is at 12 noon and afternoon tea at one. And I've been told off today. I'm not going to wash your cup if you don't come for a walk. But you're allowed to come for a cup of tea even if you don't go for a walk. <laughs> you're very welcome to both, one or other or either. If you just want to go for the walk, that's fine. If you just want to come for tea, that's fine as well. Uh, but I think it'll be good. Hopefully if you've got a day like that, it'll be nice to get a stroll around the park and get some fresh air and conversation going. Um, it's a wee reminder for the PW ladies there on it as well. But you'll see on the little flyer, there's a little slip on the bottom. Uh, we'd love to know if you're coming along to help with catering arrangements. So if possible, um, could you text Valerie uh, to say you're coming or fill in the little slip and bring it back. Just put your name in the bottom of the little slip, rub it off and bring it back. Just so I know how many scones to make. Uh, you know, I, I'm good, but uh, I'm not good at estimating numbers. That's all the announcements I have for today. We're here uh, to worship God. As I say, it's good to gather both here in the building and if you're with us online, I encourage you to join with us as we worship and as we sing and as we uh, spend time looking at God's word. But to uh, lead us in uh, to our, our worship, our first hymn is, is going to be uh, about celebrating Jesus' victory and of course what is that victory uh, and Paul gives us uh, a little hint of that every now and again doesn't he in his letter to 1 Corinthians he says now brothers and sisters I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand by this gospel you are saved 
if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you may have believed in vain. For what I received I pass on to you as, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. We're looking at Jonah and Jonah's call to go out into the world and preach the gospel. That is the gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Friends, that is the gospel we hold firm to and that we take our stand on. Let's stand uh, together now and let's worship God as we stand to sing our first hymn. Jesus, we celebrate your victory. We revel in your love. Thank you to Mark and to the praise group and all our singers here uh, today for leading us. But let's stand with them uh, and let's worship God. in our worship as we commit our time of worship to God in prayer. Let's, let's pray together. Let, let's pray. And Father God, as we come and gather here today, we acknowledge once again the awesome privilege it is to come and to lift high the name of Jesus in this place. Father, we come to worship you. We come to declare all your goodness and all your grace and all your mercy to each and every one of us. Yes, we come as we've said, to revel in your love for us. Father, we thank you for your amazing love for us. We thank you for the truth of the gospel. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his life, for his teaching. Father, we thank you for his sacrifice for us, which has purchased our salvation for us, has paid the penalty for our sin. And Father, we thank you for his glorious resurrection, which has secured that eternity in your presence for each and every one of us who put our faith and trust in you. And so, Father, we pray that that would, would, would be what would, would inspire our hearts even here as we meet today. 
Lord, as we meet, as we sing our songs, as we read your word, as, or even as, as we celebrate the wonder of the sacrament of baptism, Lord, will you stir our hearts, encourage us and enthuse us in these days. Father, help us to go out from this place, to stand firm, to make our stand and to speak out for your glory. So, Father, bless our time together here this morning, we pray. Be with us, lead us, and guide us in all things. And as we say, you might receive the praise, honour, and glory that is rightfully yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn to God's word uh, together now. It should be coming up on, on your screens, but I'm going to encourage you, as I always do, if you have uh, your Bible with you, it's good uh, to read God's word uh, together. If you're at home, get the Bible out uh, and we'll read it together. Jonah 1, uh, we're going to read just the same verses uh, we read last week. Uh, we're going to be looking at this section of Jonah for a few weeks uh, together now. Let's read God's word together. Jonah chapter 1 reading from verse 1. Jonah flees from the Lord is the, the title. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. They threw cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you be? How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe He will take notice of us, so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, "Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity." They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, "Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country?" From what people are you? They answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and I will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. And the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We'll end our reading there at the end of chapter 1. And do trust as always that uh, God will speak to us. Uh, as we turn to that uh, together later on. But first, as I say, we have uh, the pleasure uh, and joy of having the sacrament of baptism here together as a fellowship once again. So I'm going to move down to the front and we'll have a little chat down there. I can get down here, as I say, without tripping and breaking the neck. <laughs> Sitted and bitted and all here. What you 
He'll fall down in there now. There's a good screen there, but. No, no, you can't take Mark's job. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Folks, um, I know it hasn't been long since we've, we've thought about the, the sacrament of baptism together. Uh, as I said before, lockdown has been good to us. Fur the furlough scheme has worked for Glen um, Lots of people at home. Um, but it is wonderful. Uh, to be able to hear, be here and, and to celebrate it together once again uh, this morning. And my first ever uh, twins to, to baptise, so it's a, another joy and a privilege as well. Being a twin, I know the, the pleasure that parents have uh, in, in having twins. I don't know if my mother would agree with that, but um, that's what it is in my eyes anyway. But we, we have... Uh, We've had the blessing of celebrating baptism together and thinking about it quite a lot recently because of, of lockdowns and all those other things. But I, I do still think it's important for us to, to have a quick reminder of some of the things uh, that we've thought about uh, because there always is the danger, and especially as we do celebrate it so often, uh, that we treat something so significant far too lightly. Look at that. Who's that? Come on, you around here and you'll see yourself. Your mummy and daddy on TV. Huh? You're a star. Come on, you right here and you'll see yourself. Come on, Aaron James. Come on. Come on over here, do you see? We're going to have to put a gate across there as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you're in trouble now. Uh, granny, come on. <laughs> Yeah, right? I know I, I have been saying, haven't over a number of weeks, that we love to see our children here, bring them out and let them wander around. Um, so it's probably my fault, isn't it? Um, but um, let, let's turn back to, to this important day uh, for us as a fellowship and God's covenant family here in Glendermott. But of course, it is a hugely significant day uh, for Harry and Matthew. If you haven't switched them around on me, <laughs> see, you thought about it. Uh, you see, that was me putting them bad ideas into your head. Um, significant day uh, for Harry and Matthew, and of course for you, Keith and Emma, as well. Uh, as we've thought about before, and today's no different. Uh, one of the things that is central to the sacrament, and one of the things that I always want to remind us about, is the reality that baptism this is a huge responsibility for the spiritual growth of our children on both the parents' hands and of course on our hands as well as members of the fellowship here uh, who promise, well we will make a promise to, to help and to guide and to encourage uh, these parents as they take on this important task in their children's lives. But naturally the task of course is primarily to the parents uh, and conversations we have before we get to this point, it's one of the things I always remind them, and we've talked about it here before, that's what's required, is a credible profession of faith, first and foremost, and by that we mean a profession with words, of course, we're going to be asked the question here, but backed up with actions, it's required of us all as God's people, isn't it, that we don't just make a profession with our lips, but our actions uh, live that out, in other words, a lifestyle left out in accordance with Christian values and that public commitment to being here in the worshipping community of Christ Church. So that means there are a number of things parents must consider before making any vows before God. And see, we've talked about this, but it's good to have the reminder. Can you wholeheartedly and faithfully profess faith in Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord? Are you committed to your church? Do you attend Sunday worship regularly? And will you with your children be regularly involved in the life of the congregation? Those are the questions central to what we're about to, to ask. The responsibility is clearly placed on parents who make vows in line with those questions to live up to the vows and promises they make to God. And we reiterate that again as well. These are promises made to God. They're made before me as the minister and you as the congregation, but they are made to God. And so as we come to the vows 
I want to read the little statement. I, I always read the declaration before uh, we go any further. Primarily to, to you, Keith and Emma, but of course to the congregation as well. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God, this congregation, that in answering these questions, you do so with honesty and sincerity. For be assured that the blessing of God only rests upon those who so promise and then fulfil, whereas the wrath of God is the portion of those who promise lightly or thoughtlessly and neglect to fulfil their solemn obligations to him. So to know God's blessings, we make promises to God and we fulfil the promises. It's as simple as that, but there obviously are consequences uh, on the other side of that uh, as well. I'm going to ask the congregation please to stand with us uh, here this morning. So firstly, to, uh, the two questions to, to you, Keith and Emma, to begin with. In presenting these children for baptism, do you profess your faith in God as your Creator and Father? In Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier and guide. And do you promise by God's help to provide a Christian home and to bring them up in the worship and teaching of the church so that they may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour? And to you, the, the congregation gathered here today in Christ's name, who receive these children into the fellowship of this church, Promise with God's help so to order your congregational life and witness that they may grow up in the knowledge and love of God and be continuously surrounded by Christian example and influence. Amen. Don't be trying anything now. So sorry. <laughs> Of course it is. Harry, George, Oliver, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You didn't like that, did you? No. All right, Matthew. Matthew, Raymond, Oliver, Matthew, Raymond, Robin, Oliver, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh dear, you like to even less. <laughs> These children are now received according to Christ's command into the membership of the Holy, Universal, and Apostolic Church, and are engaged to be the Lord's. Let's sing the ironic blessing together. Let's just pray together uh, as we finish. Let's, let's pray. No, you down there and keep Mark company? He's all, he's, all, he's all right at the minute. He's at the bottom so we can't fall any further. <laughs> let's, let, let's just pray briefly as we close. Father, we thank you for the wonder of this sacrament. Father, we thank you that you receive our children into the fellowship of this church. Lord, we thank you uh, that you have received Harry and Matthew into this congregation here today, and Lord, we pray for them. We pray, Lord, that you would help their, their parents, Keith and Emma, to, to help them grow both in body and in mind, and of course, help them to live up uh, to these vows they have made, or that they might grow 
spiritually too, and one day come to know Jesus as Saviour and Lord. Lord, we pray you would bless them, you would help them. Lord, we pray that you would bless and help us as a congregation to answer our calling to help all the parents in this congregation to bring up their children in the knowledge and love of God. So bless us all now, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I always do, I have a little one for each. Look, Aaron James, one for you as well. I know you've been off in your hands there nearly. Do you want me to set them over? Um, take time uh, and read God's word to them. And we do, as I would say, trust that you will all come to know God as Saviour and Lord. Remind me what I'm doing now. We're going to sing again, aren't we? Yes, we're going to sing. Uh, I know we, we chop and change a little bit of our... Turn them down to the ground. We're going to sing. We, we chop and change our baptismal hymn a little bit, but I love singing this one here. I think it's a great one because it, it is written with our, our children in mind uh, as we come to, to one of the verses. So let, let's, let's sing this uh, together. God sent us on, they called him Jesus.
It's wonderful what you can do with a couple of cheers. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to, to George for a couple of minutes. If you remember, about two weeks ago, uh, George led the service and he planted grass seeds and he promised his grass. So now we're going to see if he's a man of his word. Um, if he hasn't already cut the first run of silage off it, um, but we'll see. I doubt if the silage is cut yet, but we'll see how it goes here. George, over to you. Hello, boys and girls. Come on, you do better than that. Remember, you were told to be quiet in church. This is the time you can shout out. Hello, boys and girls. Hello. 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 Right. Those that were here two weeks ago would know, as Stephen said, I planted grass seed in the pulpit. And I did all the preparation work. I consulted the packet to say what I had to do. So I got all the weeds out. I got all those big stones out. I raked it very, very well till it was really fine soil so then I planted the grass seed just as the packet said and I even went back to the Bible because the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4 tells us exactly what we need to do in order to plant grass seed initially and then moving on then to the spiritual context of it. So could you turn Holly on there Edward please? Right Holly over to you. I can assure you folks that the term watching paint dry has nothing to watching grass grow because I've been watching this every single day and look it's, it's come on it's, it, it, it's planted two weeks it told us we'd have results in a week but when I think about this and it's just perfect for a baptismal uh, service as well this is like the little babies that come along to church these are the little babies that are carried into church and it's new growth it's new it's all there's not a weed there at all at the minute. But if that was left and not tended, what would happen to it? It would probably grow to be that height. It would need to be cut. I'm not going to cut it here because I know you don't want to be grass cuttings on the, on the ground. It would grow to that height. I'm sure birds would throw weeds into it and things as well, little seeds of weeds, and the weeds would grow up through it, whether I liked it or not. But it's a very important that... As families, we bring our children along for baptism, but then we have to bring them back into the church. We've promised to do that. Bring them back to us. Let us in the church help the parents to bring their children up in the ways of the church so that we can nurture that young person. Bring them to the boys' brigade, the girls' brigade, the youth club, the, bring them to Sunday school, bring them to church, because it's the only way we're going to do it. And maybe by doing that, that the weeds will stay away in their lives and we will have a chance within church to, to bring up. And they'll look just as well as this here. You know, some of them might even grow hair. <laughs> so this, this has been a bit of a success story because I wondered where I was, what I was going to do if this didn't grow. But it, it actually did grow. It wasn't me that grew it. It was God's work that grew it. And God will work within each of the young people's lives if we bring them along to church and bring them along to all the organisations and we will have a chance then of making them into the Christians of the future. Okay, thank you. Are you sure you just didn't cut that as a saw out in the garden? No? <laughs> I'm going round to check your garden later on, <laughs> just to be sure. Am I on? Yeah, it just doesn't sound as loud as I normally do. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, George, th thank you for planting the seed. Uh, and I do trust that, as you say, that as we come to church, that that seed is planted within our young people, of course, but within us all. Uh, and we allow God to grow that seed within us uh, that we might serve him and worship him uh, as he so rightly deserves. Um, but we're going to worship him together now. Uh, our next hymn as we prepare ourselves to come uh, to God's word is there is a higher throne than all this world has known. Let's stand and let's worship God together.
Uh, I wonder uh, if any of you remember uh, the character from the, the Peanuts cartoons, you know, the ones that mean Peanuts and Charlie Brown and all the rest of it. A little character called Linus. He was Charlie Brown's best friend, and he was the little guy who was nearly always seen sucking his thumb and carrying around this little blue uh, security or, or comfort blanket. Remember him? Yeah. I think it's interesting when you go back and look at these characters and keep uh, as an adult. I certainly do, because in spite of, of that image that we have of him sucking his thumb and trailing this dirty blanket behind him and so on, he was actually the intelligent one. He was a, a philosopher and theologian in the group, if we could put it that way. And he did actually quote from the Gospels quite often. Anybody ever picked that up? You're all going to go on YouTube now and try and find Charlie Brown. Linus, quoted from the Gospels quite often. Now, a wee bit of a warning, I suppose. He also claimed to believe in the great pumpkin who appeared every Halloween bearing gifts. So, just need to be careful about the advice we're taking from him. But, it's interesting when we have this advice coming from someone we don't expect. And that's why I'm bringing him into Jonah's story today, because there's a piece of wisdom that we could almost say Jonah followed. There's a little piece of Linus's uh, wisdom that, that Jonah uh, followed, and certainly there's a lot of us today could be tempted to follow it as well. But when it comes to God and God's ways and God's commands to us and God's call on our lives, the advice is deeply flawed. One day Linus and Charlie Brown were sitting chatting together and Linus says this, he says, I don't like to face problems head on. I think the best way to solve problems is to avoid them. In fact, there's no problem or situation so big or so complicated that I can't run away from it. No problem or no situation so big or so complicated that it can't be run away from. We'd maybe agree with that sometimes, wouldn't we? There's no doubt there are plenty of situations in life where sometimes it is better and wiser to step away. But God's call to Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it, and our call as God's church today to go out into all the world and preach the gospel isn't one of those situations that we can run away from easily. It can't be avoided. We can't run away from God. Like we considered last week God's call to each and every one of us who professes to be a Christian and are seeking to follow and to serve God in our lives is not to sit back in our wee bubble of comfortable Christianity. But to get up and get out there and preach the God-given message of God's grace and salvation to a world that is in desperate need to hear it. It's our world that needs to be saved and we cannot run away or shirk from our responsibility of going out there. We can't run away of it because, well, primarily it's a, a sovereign call from the Almighty God. And of course, if we do try and run away, it's it's just plain, outright disobedience to God. And as believers, obviously that, that doesn't wear, does it? We seek to live obedient lives, not disobedient lives. Now I know for Jonah and for many of us, maybe just sitting back and doing nothing doesn't sound too bad. For Jonah, he just didn't seem to want to do what he knew was right. It doesn't sound too bad, does it? But you see, that's part of the problem with Jonah's sin here, and in fact, any sin. We convince ourselves that it doesn't sound too bad. Sure, there's worse going on out there, isn't there? The fact that I just come here on a Sunday and do nothing else. It's not that bad, is it? I know 
Yet, sure, we'll all fail God at some point. We all fail to follow God's way sometimes as we struggle through life. We know that. But this is different. When we have a clear call from God to do something and don't do it. This is, in a sense, outright premeditated disobedience to God. Plain and simple terms, it is sin. Now we had a quick glimpse of Jonah's disobedience last week, but for today I want us to take a closer look at this flight of sin, is how I've labelled it, and see the progression of Jonah's sin and the folly of his actions and see what, what we can learn from it. And there's a couple of specific words in this uh, initial call uh, to Jonah that I want us, want us all to notice. Because I think they, they show us this obvious movement of sin. The two words in Jonah's call are arise and down. I don't know if you picked them up as we read through it there. Arise and down. Arise and go to Nineveh, God said. And of course, Jonah arose all right, but in the complete opposite direction. And because he arose and went in the complete opposite direction, that's where the down comes in. It was all downhill from there on. After he arose, he went down, firstly down to Joppa to find the ship to help him get away. And of course, there was a boat there. But it's not always the way. When we've taken that mindset to ignore God, you can be sure as shooting as the saying goes that Satan is waiting there in the wings, ready with the ways and means to help you. It's not too bad. Let's run away and get a ship. Sure enough, it's there. Friend, when your heart and mind and will wander away from God, that is the truth of it. Satan is always there, ready and waiting. That's how he works. That's how sin works. When we turn away from God, and comes Satan. So Jonah arose and he went down to Java. And the downward spiral continues. He goes down again, doesn't he? Down below the deck of the ship to try and hide from God and from the world around him. Down, down, down and down he goes. Down to Java, down into the hold of the ship. He gets thrown overboard, down into the sea. He gets swallowed up, down into the belly of the wheel. And friends, if that path of sin isn't reversed, the last down in this progression will be down into the depths of hell where Satan is sitting waiting for him, having helped him from the very start of the journey. And friend, as you think about that simple progression and folly of Jonah's actions. How simple it seemed. Isn't there a clear lesson for us all here about the downward spiral that sin leads us in? If we're even remotely thinking about toying with any kind of temptation or sin at all, we need to wake up to the reality of our foolishness. We need to wake up and smell the coffee as the saying goes, because it really is foolishness, isn't it? I mean, think about it. What on earth made Jonah think that he could run away from God? Jonah boarded the ship to flee from the presence of the Lord. How daft does that sound even? You're on a ship to flee from the presence of the Lord. But that's what happens, isn't it? When you take your eyes off God and allow Satan to have his wee foothold in your heart. He knew and we know there's absolutely nowhere we can flee from the presence of God. 
Psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my way to the bed of the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. What on earth made Jonah think he could escape the presence of the, of the Lord? By simply getting onto a ship. You see, Jonah's problem wasn't a physical one, was it? To think that we can flee from God in any physical sense is just foolishness, isn't it? But Jonah's problem, and, and often our problem, is a problem with our hearts. It's a problem with our attitudes towards others even. And we touched briefly on that as well last week. There's no doubt that Jonah was a man of outstanding character. He was a man of outward godliness. He was God's prophet. He was a well-respected member of the church, if we could call it that if it was in today's terms. He was well up there in the Jewish circles, a good church person. But he failed miserably to look after the affairs of his heart. He had a serious heart problem. He had a problem with anger, with resentment, with bitterness towards others. He had a problem with self-righteousness and a judgmental attitude towards other people. The people that God had asked him to go. He had a heart problem, hadn't he? God had called him to go and speak to a particular section of the community, if we want to put it in our terms today. But Jonah was having none of it. I'm not going to speak to them, boys. And his heart was as a bit of a side while he on it. What effect do you think that anger and resentment and all that was boiling up inside Jonah had on the Ninevites? What effect does that anger and resentment to the communities around us have on the communities? None. All it does is boil up inside us. All it done to Jonah was boil up inside him and harden his heart even more. Satan really had a good hold on him there. And isn't it true we can be so like him? Let's be honest. And I'll put my hand up as well. How many of us so-called professing Christians harbor anger and resentment against others? How many of us harbor that self-righteous attitude and refuse to forgive others? And all it does they end up cultivating even more bitterness and anger in our own hearts. Forgiveness, friends, is paramount, isn't it, to our relationships with each other and with God. It's central to it all, isn't it? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That what we looked at not that long ago in the Lord's Prayer. One of those things we rhyme off very easily. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So if we don't forgive those who sin against us, where does that leave us? We often talk about the Solomon, or the wisdom of Solomon. And I think he, write, he writes directly to Jonah's problem and to our problem. And you'll know these words. We've all heard them. Above all else. Above all else. Guard your heart. For everything you do. Flows from it. Everything you do. Flows from the motivation of your heart. Doesn't it? Jonah had forgotten that. And we can forget it so so easily as well. Can't we? And I don't really want to say that the answer to the problem is fairly simple. But it is. 
The only way to guard our hearts are with a couple of things that seem to be significantly missing from this whole escapade with Jonah. Listening to God through his word and to prayer. And if we can master those two things, it will make the world of difference. Because they are glaringly missing from this escapade of Jonah. The very first words that we read. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. God spoke directly to Jonah. And he completely ignored it. Everything he'd been taught over the years from God's word. Completely ignored it. And there's absolutely no mention anywhere here in the opening section of this escapade of Jonah taking time to talk to God in prayer. Not once in this foolish flight is he found talking to God about the situation, the situation and asking God for, for help or, or for guidance. His heart was as hard as they come, as we'd say. And Satan would no doubt have been loving it. And I am sure you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Above all else, guard our hearts. We are called to go out into a godless society. And we need to guard our hearts. And we do it through Bible study and prayer. They are paramount to living in line with God's will for each of our lives. And friend, what you listen to and learn together here on a Sunday, it's just not enough. It doesn't cut it. It's good, but it doesn't cut it. There's the challenge for us today. Friend, how is your devotional life? What place does Bible study and prayer have in your life? What are you reading at the moment? Is it something that will help edify your heart spiritually? Or is it, well, to coin a phrase from a, a good lady I know, a trashy mag. These ladies ever read trashy mags. You get them in any news agent. Something which is helping Satan get a toe on the door. We need to be found in God's word. Are you studying and praying every day? Because the danger is if you're not, you can end up like Jonah here. We allow Satan to have that foothold in our heart. Never mind the wee toe through the door. You can so easily get drawn away and tempted by the, the things of the world. I wonder have you allowed your heart to become hard with bitterness and anger or yeah, even self-righteousness? Well, my simple advice to you today, friend, is to do exactly what Jonah didn't do. Get on your knees and talk to God. Get stuck in his word every day and learn how he wants you to live. Learn and remember his promises to you. God willing and restrictions permitted. When the new season of midweek Bible studies and prayer time start around September time. Be there. One of God's greatest remedies against sin and folly is Christian fellowship. Where we meet to learn together, to encourage each other, and to pray for and with each other. God has given us these things. Wouldn't it be true to say that instead of running off to Joppa, it would have done Jonah a lot more good to run to his friends. Talk about the situation and pray about it with them. Because Jonah's folly is a stark warning to each and every one of us. If this mighty prophet of God could be tempted away from God and into sin. Don't you think we could be tempted too? Make 
Make use of the resources that God has given you. Make use of his, his mighty and loving word. Make use of the blessing of Christian fellowship and the wise counsel of God's people that he has placed you amongst. And make use of this wonderful blessing of prayer. Because many a shipwrecked heart could have been spared by such an obvious course of action, friends. We've mentioned time after time how dark our world seems to be getting and how resistant to the gospel message that it's getting in these days. It's not a great situation out there. But our call is to get out there. And that means it's imperative. Imperative that we prepare ourselves for it. That we be empowered and encouraged through our relationship with God. With his word and with his people. And get out there and answer the call. Because our world needs to desperately hear it in these days. I'll see you in September. I'll see you before that, but I'll see you on a Wednesday night. Let me pray with you. Let's, let's pray. Father, as we often finish here, we thank you for your word, and Lord, we do thank you for your word. Lord, your word tells us that it is a mighty double-edged sword. The weapon that we go in to war against Satan with. And yet as we've recognised here before, there's so many of them sitting in shelves, dusty. Lying in cupboards, never opened. And Father, we pray that you would move within our own hearts. Speak to each and every one of us. Motivate us to get stuck back into your word as you call us. Lord, to use that word to help us and empower us to go out into the world you've called us with that gospel message. And Father, we do pray, Lord, as we take this, I suppose, what is commonly known as a summer break from church activities, not to take a break from your word, not to take a break from speaking to you in prayer. Lord, come back in September invigorated ready to meet together not just on a Sunday but on a Wednesday night through all the different organisations that go on here Lord we pray that each one would indeed return to help us serve your world so will you speak to us bless us, help us each one we pray for we ask it in Jesus name Amen. Amen. I'm going to finish our last piece of praise uh, together this morning. Uh, as great as the darkness that covers the earth. We've alluded to it already. We've alluded to it week after week. Um, and we're going to stand uh, and sing about it. This is the truth, isn't it? But the truth is within it as well. That we have the power to go out. Uh, and to, with the message into the world. So let's stand and let's sing this together. Great is the darkness that covers the earth.
thank you for joining with us in worship here today. If you're watching online, thank you for joining with us there. But we're going to close, uh, as we always do, with our God of love and light prayer. And then I close with some words of benediction. But let's, let's pray together. God of love and light, in this time of fear, give us your peace. In this time of isolation, give us your presence. In this time of sickness, give us your healing. In this time of uncertainty, give us your wisdom. In this time of darkness, shine your light upon us all. In Jesus' name, amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with the hope you have by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Folks, just want to take your seats uh, as usual. Uh,